One of the things that we preachers like to do is um, talk. <laughs> try not to wait till the last minute. And sometimes we look at something and we go, why in the world did I choose that? Which is exactly where I am today. <laughs> I've been thinking and praying and we're going to see what the Lord pulls out, y'all. Just going to say. But before we enter this time and, and share in the scriptures together, let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So you may or may not be familiar with one of the uh, apostles named Stephen, one of the leaders of the church. He was, in fact, the very first martyr. And if you've ever wanted the cliff notes on what happened with the Jewish people, how are the Jewish people... How do they come to who they are? How do they understand what they are? How do they, what is the history of the Jewish people? The cleft notes are in chapter 7 of Acts. You just start there, verse 1, as Peter gives the high priests and the Sadducees a history lesson in their own history. You ever had anybody do that to you? I have. Well, what you don't realize, little girl, is <laughs> my, children, my parents used to do that. Um, but Stephen is trying to get the leaders. He's been arrested. And he's trying to get the leaders to understand exactly who this Jesus was and why this Jesus made such a difference. And so he begins telling them the story of who they are from the beginning of the call of Abraham up until the death of Jesus. But I'm going to begin reading to you in chapter 7, beginning a little before what I originally had listed. Uh, I'm going to begin with... I'm going to begin with verse... 46. And this is part of the history lesson. So Stephen has reminded them of, of their being called by Abraham. He's reminded them of wandering in the desert. He's reminding them of the prophets that God has sent to them. He's reminding them of how God fed them when they had no food and no water in the desert. He's reminding them of how time and time again the prophets brought God before them and the people rejected God. And here he goes with David. David found favor with God and asked for the privilege of building a permanent temple for the son of God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who actually built it. But these are the words I want you to hear. However, the Most High doesn't live in temples made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Could you build me a temple as good as that, asked the Lord? Could you build me such a resting place? Didn't my hands make both heaven and earth? And then, he, and then Stephen continues to the, the, these priests. You stubborn people. You are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did. And so do you. Name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah who you betrayed and murdered. You deliberately disobeyed God's law, and even though you received it from the hands of angels. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation, and they shook their fists at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, 
gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand, and he told them, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. They rushed to him, and they dragged him out of the city, and they began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees, shouting, Lord, don't charge them with the sin. And with that, he died. These are God's words for God's people. <laughs> Thanks be to God. There's a lot there. But one thing I want you to place in your brain is when Stephen is talking to the leaders, he's talking to the Jewish leaders, but I really want you to hear the church. Stephen is talking to the church at the time, saying, don't you get it? So, got a question. How many English teachers among us? She's out today. Okay, this will be a good lesson for y'all. Do you know what foreshadowing is? Ah, y'all were listening in school. That's good. This story has foreshadowing in it. Now, I told you it just gave the entire history. If we read that entire chapter, we'd have heard the entire history of the people of Israel. But foreshadowing is a literary device in which we give a hint. We, we give some kind of a hint about what is going to come later in the story. And it kind of helps develop your expectations. Now, one of my favorite movies, you know, there's some movies that are really good at using this and others aren't, but one of my favorite movies that I like that uses foreshadowing is The Shawshank Redemption. Anybody like that movie? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. One of my favorite scenes in that movie is that everything, if you think about the warden in the movie, everything he does is based on religion, isn't it? He justifies every step he makes based on religion. And he comes into Andy's cell one day and he picks up Andy's Bible, which makes Andy a little nervous. And he looks at the Bible and he says, you know, salvation lies within. Well, it's not until we get to the end of the movie that we see how Andy escaped. Because within the Bible was the cutout of a pickaxe that he used to dig his way out of jail. Andy knew that within that Bible, his salvation, his release was within, but the warden didn't know it. And we didn't really get it until we put it all together. Well, scripture is full of it. Scripture is full of foreshadowing, full of allegory, simile, all those things you thought you would never, ever need to say again once you got out of school unless you're a teacher. <coughs> Jesus said over and over, the kingdom of God is among you. Hey, somebody's got a text going on. <laughs> <laughs> We're notified. We got it. Okay. Just don't want any crises to be in front. Jesus said, you know, you're going to hear about wars and rumors of wars. You're going to hear about things. If we look back in the Old Testament, we hear about Messiah who is to come. We hear what will happen to Messiah when he dies. And all these things we see played out as we get further along in the story. But the testimony of Stephen says something that religious people really don't want to hear. He says there is more 
then you understand. There is a God of redemption who brings all to all of us, brings peace and grace to all of us. It's not about being right and wrong. It's not about standing in places of judgment saying, we got it figured out and you don't. It's about a God of mercy and a God of grace. It's about living in the way that we should. But there was one verse in all that scripture as Stephen is trying to, to just point them at exactly who Jesus was and what Jesus was about was at the very Close to the very end, it says, they became so enraged, they took off their cloaks and they laid them at the foot of a man named Saul. Who is this Saul? This passage doesn't tell us anything other than we know somehow he's associated with this group of religious leaders. He's somehow associated with these people who are proclaiming judgment. He is somehow a person who is affirming that he approves of their step. We come to know a little later that Saul becomes one of the, the, the biggest pursuer of those who are trying to follow the way of Christ. And he becomes the greatest persecutor of the Christians. Paul is part of a church that is determined to be right. And it's going to hang on to its traditions regardless. He's part of a people that are so determined to be right that they forget about God's mercy and hope and love and forgiveness that was practiced and given to them for years and years and generations and generations before. As we continue along the storyline, we will find that the arrogance of Paul will be laid low. Saul will be laid low. We'll find out that things are going to be different. This notorious defender of the Christian faith. This notorious this Saul who is this notorious persecutor of the Christian faith becomes the notorious defender of the Christian faith. After he has an encounter. It's been my experience in life that people who are absolutely positively certain of an answer to the point that they are willing to be unyielding and unforgiving and not even invest in a conversation are people who are deathly afraid. There are people who don't want to take a chance to listen and to hear and to understand. We as a church are called to bring the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ said, come to me, all you who are weary, all of you who need rest, all of you who are tired of standing up and saying that I have the only way because my way is not the way, y'all. Your way is not the way. Christ's way, Jesus' way. That's the path that we should pursue. That's what we need to be thinking when we find ourselves in places of judgment, when we find ourselves in places where we are bound and determined to tell everybody exactly what it is they should do. Now, I'm not telling you that when somebody comes to offer you their advice, you say, are you Jesus? Because the preacher said, that's the only person I should be listening to. <laughs> But I am saying that God calls us not to react, but to listen and to act 
with grace and mercy. <laughs> to act with forgiveness and love. To be a people that become a place of welcome and home. Because God wants that. If God could pursue the Hebrew people throughout all the trials and tribulations in the Old Testament and going forward, don't you think he wants us to? Jesus is called to us. He says, you may have stood in judgment at some point in time, but that's not important any longer. What's important is that you're mine and I am yours. So as we prepare our hearts and our minds to receive Holy Communion today, I, I ask you very directly, are you in that notorious place of judgment? Or is it time for you to lay that down and allow God to do some incredible things in your life? To break the seeds of bitterness, to heal the places of brokenness, and to allow the balm of forgiveness and grace to move into your life that you may offer it to others. Where are you in this journey? Do you, oh, this is a hard question. Because you see, when I, when I become a believer, I give up my rights. I give up my rights to be correct. I give up my rights to be anything but a carrier of the word and a giver of love and forgiveness. I give up my position of judgment and I move to a place of welcome. On your journey, are you ready to give up your rights? And to become a follower and a defender and a champion for Jesus Christ. Because you see, together we can transform this world. And it's a broken world. But it needs people to speak life into it. And it needs people to speak hope into it. And it needs people who are willing to make a difference. How and where is God challenging you in your life? And how is God calling you to move forward? Would you pray with me? <coughs> Gracious God of all that we are, and God of whose we are, we offer ourselves to you this day. We can look back and we can see a long history of places where we stood in judgment and places of where we demanded to be right. And Lord, you just remind us that it's not about that. It is about you. So help us to live into those places, to be those people that you call, and to make a difference in the world around us. We pray all this in Jesus' holy name.